This is the 1290 Super Duke GT, and it's the most touring oriented of KTM's road bikes. In most other manufacturers' ranges, it would probably be the sportiest of their sport touring models. And it's that difference that sort of sums up a company that lives by the motto, ready to race. I rode this bike two years ago after its last major update. And although I really, really rated it, I had ridden it after spending some time with the R, the naked version. I completely fell in love with that thing. And so maybe this GT suffered a bit by comparison. I think I ended up saying, if I wanted to go touring with this engine, then I'd take the R and just fit a little fly screen and some soft luggage. I meant it as well, but it's one of those almost glib pronouncements that you kind of half regret as perhaps a bit cheap, a bit too soundbitey, you know? So although the 2022 version of the GT has only received some fairly minor updates, I thought I'd take the opportunity to revisit it and see if that initial impression still holds true. Whenever you ride one of these 1290 KTMs, it's impossible to start talking about the bike in any other way than with the engine. This 1.3 litre V-twin is an absolute monster of a motor or a beast if you prefer. That is, after all, what KTM calls the R. And for once, it's not all overblown marketing hype. It really is a beast. As you might imagine of a big V-twin, it produces an absolute tidal wave of torque. 141 newton meters of the stuff to be exact, and it has an equally impressive 175 horsepower to throw into the mix as well. These figures have remained largely unchanged since I first experienced this engine back in 2014, but it has gained a significant amount of civility along the way, and now it is a much smoother operator and prepared to bimble along at low RPM in a high gear without feeling like it wants to shake itself to bits. That might not sound like the most interesting of abilities, but when you've got to live with a bike on a day-to-day -day basis, even a sport bike, you want it to be civilised, you want it to be easy to ride, you don't want it to feel like it's going to shudder and shake and basically stall every time you're not really paying attention. Or when you're touring and you've got a passenger you're trying to look after and you don't want there to be a jerky throttle response or to feel like it's going to stall every time you maybe let the revs drop a bit too low because you're not paying attention, because you've been distracted by some ruins. Bloody hell, look at those. There's lots of spectacular stuff along the Danube here, but as far as ruins go, there's res, I'd say. That was apparently the castle where Richard the Lionheart was held captive. The English king who was fond of fighting and crusading and ruled England from a castle in France. I'm not sure his lodgings gave him a good view of the Danube here to the east of the city of Linz in Austria, but I have made a mental note to go back and have a closer look. However, at the moment, complete Philistine that I am, I'd rather be riding the GT. And more to the point, I'd rather be on a winding road where I can really feel the best of what this engine has to offer. And that is incredible throttle response. No matter what gear or what range of RPM you decide to play with, the result is just ridiculously easy yet wickedly rapid acceleration. As a method of blurring the straight bits between the corners, I don't think there's any finer tool for the job. Behind the headline grabbing engine, there is a chassis that makes controlling all that performance remarkably stress free and nowhere near as intimidating as it probably should be. 
A chrome molly tubular space frame holds everything together, complemented by a single-sided swing arm and monoshock at the back, and a stout 48mm fork up front, and the suspension is semi-active with settings not only for comfort, street and sport, there's also a range of remotely adjustable preload settings for any combination of rider, passenger and luggage. The suspension's brain can adapt the damping, load and anti-dive rates in real time. In case anything gets past that system, there is a WP steering damper to prevent any underpant staining tank slapping moments. The wheels are new and manage to save a valuable kilo of unsprung weight, and they are shod with Continental's Conti Sport Attack 4 tyres that I have to say performed faultlessly and gave me plenty of feedback so that when I felt like a bit of extra lean angle, I could increase the angle of dangle quite confidently. The brakes are Brembo monoblock calipers with 320mm front discs and they are, just as you would expect, totally excellent with feel and bite and power for days. What that gives you is a bike that wants to be in corners at speed where it will reward you with loads of stability and as a consequence lots of confidence as well it's that whole almost cheesy ready to race mantra but I tell you what you would not hesitate to take this supposedly touring bike to enjoy on a track day you really wouldn't and don't think just because it has a really planted feel when it's leant over that the payoff is that somehow it's going to feel cumbersome because it's far from that it really is very agile for something that claims to be a tourer to be fair i've ridden plenty of uh, proper supposedly proper sport bikes that are uh, take a lot more effort and hassle to get around the turns than this touring bike does, that's for sure. Part of the sport bike feeling undoubtedly comes from the ergonomics. This is a riding position that just feels sporty, even at standstill. There's a bit of a, a tuck for the legs and they're a little bit further back than you might expect, which is ideal for moving yourself around when you're being sporty. It's the same story up here as well, where you have a noticeable lean over the front end to a comparatively low handlebar. Good for feeling like you're in charge when you're doing the sports thing, but less so for covering distance as comfortably as possible when you'd prefer a little bit more height. There's more weight on your wrist than on something like BMW's S1000XR or the V4 Multistrada. On my first ride, I was in the seat for about three hours and 240 kilometers or so, and I definitely noticed a bit more ache in my wrists and also my shoulders than I expected from a bike that is designed for long distance work. The seat though was a horrible plank and an optional version on the last one I rode. This one is the standard seat, I think, and it really isn't quite as bad but there again it's still not good the rubbish seat on my mt09 is better and this is supposed to be a touring bike the same thing goes for the pillion seat my wife is not at all impressed with her hard seat but otherwise they're quite roomy ergonomics for the passenger although she can't get really comfortable with the little rear grab rail finally there's the screen, adjustable even on the move. The wind protection, because you can tailor it to a certain extent, is actually pretty good. My shoulders are always in the breeze, which doesn't bother me, and I can fine tune it to take most of the buffeting away from my head. I don't think this is the standard screen. I mean, it's a tinted option, but I think it's probably the same dimensions as the standard one. Talking of options, there's a lot of those to consider with this being a KTM and the way they do things and that's long before you've even thought about having a look at the Passports catalogue. Don't get me wrong, 
There's a lot that comes as standard with the GT, but this is an expensive bike that you are almost definitely going to want to make even more expensive by ticking a few of the electronic items that you might as well have on your flagship orange tourer. As standard, there's the lean angle sensitive traction control that adjusts its parameters for intervening to keep you safe based on your riding mode. So sport will obviously allow more spin from the rear than you'll get with street or rain modes. If you're feeling brave or maybe stupid, you can turn it off completely. There's also lean angle sensitive cornering ABS and of course being a KTM, you can turn the ABS off on the rear wheel if you want to lock up the rear tire for backing your pannier laden beast into the occasional hairpin. You can take the performance mode optional extra and then you'll be able to finesse the level of traction control on the move via the paddle style buttons and you can use launch control or remove the anti wheelie mode. Another option comes in the form of motor slip regulation, which is basically an electronic slipper clutch type of effect that helps you to get manic with your braking and downshifts without provoking too much hopping and bouncing around on the way into a corner. All right then, enough of all the technology, impressive as it may be. I need to head back to Matikhoven in a couple of minutes to return the bike, so how would I sum up the GT? Well. For a start, I'd say the GT label itself is a bit of a misnomer because that designation implies more luxurious comfort and high-speed cruising ability than this bike actually delivers. KTM's idea of a GT is a barely disguised sport bike, which is fantastic if that's what you're after. A sport bike that has a smidgen extra distance covering ability and isn't a definite divorce in waiting if you want to take your better half on holiday with you although I think it might still make your partner grumpy rather than grateful. BMW's S1000XR is very similar in its approach, but it veers more towards the touring end of the equation. It's a bit more of a long distance weapon, but the KTM is undoubtedly a more involving sporting tool. Ducati's V4 Multistrada strikes a balance somewhere between the two of them and is quite possibly in the sweetest spot of them all. Having said that, I haven't yet ridden the new Tiger 1200 from Triumph and in its most road oriented guise, that is also worthy of consideration as a touring bike with this kind of riding position and ability, albeit with a good handful less horsepower. Strangely though, I reckon that anyone considering the GT, its biggest competitor for their money is probably the bike I'm on my way to pick up. The Super Adventure S, Yes, I know it's an adventure touring bike, but let me tell you, this is still a brilliant road bike that will happily fulfill all your road riding needs. I'm gonna be spending the coming week with the Super Adventure, so join me in the next episode when I'll have answered my own need to know question whether, given the choice, I take the GT or that as a touring road bike. I actually had a great ride back to Matikhoven, by the way, and much to my surprise, I actually already missed the GT. It's a great bike. I became more attached to it the longer I spent with it, and there's a lot more detail to tell you about. Some of it good and some less so, but I've run out of time here, so if you want to check out that extended detailed discussion, then please head over to our YouTube channel. The base price of the GT here in Europe is €20,600, or about 355,000 Rand. If you really want a GT, and I can totally understand that being the case, then you'll have to speak very nicely with your KTM dealer to see if they can bring one in especially for you. Okay, ad break time. Back in a moment. <laughs> 